hello everyone. Here we are today with uh, Dr. Hilda Gabrielides, uh, who is very well known in the circles here in human rights and restorative justice. And uh, we're just going to have a few questions uh, for you, Theo. So, first of all, uh, for those that do, do not know you very well, um, could you tell us a bit about yourself, your background, and how you got into restorative justice? How did I get into restorative justice? Okay. Um, well, my um, background is legal. Mm -hmm. So, I did. Um, a long time ago, <laughs> my law degrees, and I come from a family of lawyers, mm -hmm. from my dad's law firm, and um, I think I was doing, yeah, I started my PhD, and it was on victims' rights in the criminal justice system, and I remember writing 100,000 words in just the first year about victims' rights, and I was doing that LSE with somebody called Professor Mikhail Alessi, and I came across the sort of justice. Um, because I was in a comparative um, thesis uh, for Europe and I went to my supervisor and I said I think I want to change my topic, my PhD topic and I want to do something on restorative justice and I said well you want to be 100,000 words then you can be them and then we can start again and that's what I did and I got into it I think it was around back in 2000, 2000 and ended up doing a PhD in restorative justice, which is called um, restorative justice theory and practice, addressing the discrepancy. Mm -hmm. um, and as you can figure out from the title, um, I've spoken, I think I spoke to probably 500 practitioners from around the world at the time. Um, I realized that restorative justice promises a lot, says a lot. Mm -hmm. And then what happens in practice and in reality is quite different from the normative promises. Um, and aspirations of restorative justice, which are quite vulnerable mm -hmm. um, and very complementary to the current, current criminal justice system, um, but the realities of practice um, are quite different from that. Okay, that's interesting. So that's from your experience turning around. Do you think that uh, uh, the services or the way restorative justice is implemented and delivered uh, does not live up to the expectations created by theory, for example? Um, yeah, you could put it that way. I mean, there's no consistency, so you would see variations between countries, between cases and different criminal justice systems. So sometimes practice will surprise you, you know, mm -hmm. because um, let's not forget where restorative justice um, comes from. So it comes, well, at least what I've been saying in my publications, mm -hmm. from community-born and community-led practices. So let's not forget about indigenous practices. In fact, you know, if you read... The so that accounts for the diversity. Yeah, I mean, we say restorative justice, but we, you know, we don't all mean the same thing. And you know, it's not like, oh, this is a table, and we're going to build a little table, and it's got four legs and a surface. Well, restorative justice is a very diverse concept. So if you go to Canada and you speak to um, people from, from Canada, especially you know, Aboriginal communities, they, they understand it in a certain way. Mm -hmm. If you come to Europe and you spoke about you know, restorative justice in a very kind of legal and top-down structured way, it would mean remediation, it would mean something else, right? So we're not all talking about the same issue, but what I can tell you is that if you look at the history, you can tra trace it back to, I don't know, Greek ancient civilizations and, um, you know, um, civilizations in Africa, uh, New Zealand, Ma Maori practices. So it, the practices are very rich sometimes, and they're a lot more complicated than the theoretical understandings of restorative justice. So I wouldn't say that practice is not as good, some practices are, mm -hmm. and so maybe theory needs to be written about those practices, mm -hmm. but I can tell you that some theoretical arguments are not always backed up with, um, with practice. Mm -hmm. And also that, for example, you talked about uh, how uh, there is no uniformity in the way uh, mm -hmm. practices are applied and delivered, mm -hmm. and that could be brought in terms of, uh, obviously the issue that I experienced to mine is some people getting a better service than others. Mm. So there's no, there's no guarantee at the moment that uh, um, a client or a victim or offender mm. is going to be uh, is going to get the best possible service from a pro pro uh, practitioner because best practice is not mm. uh, uh, consensuated and uh, is not uh, shared mm. widely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean we need to be careful when we say when we mm. say that. And I mean coming again, you know, from a legal background where you, you know, you you function within a very structured criminal justice system, 
and you also have responsibility when you offer an option to be responsible for that option, whether it's for the victim or the offender. But when it comes to it, so you just need to be very careful how you 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 know you offer it. Now, um, as I said, it is a community community born community law practice. So if you try to standardize it too much, it will take its heart away. Okay, it, it, you will remove the very essence of what it is. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so let's be very careful when we're trying to define it, when we're trying to regulate it, when we're trying to control it. I mean, it's like controlling love and trying to define love. You know, from one person to the other, it will be different. The mm -hmm. question is, what is love? What is the essence of it? And what are you getting out of it? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, one practice uh, might even say that it's restorative justice, and in the end, it isn't. Okay? Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it all goes down to what are the basic principles that will characterize something. And you know, we're talking about love. What is that thing that we call it then? You know, what, what is that thing that will give you the essence of, of, of it being love? Mm -hmm. um, you can write it down on the list of principles. You can write it down in terms of, you know, um, evaluation and all those sort of things. But at the end of the day, is it what it's supposed to be? Mm -hmm. okay. But then, what would you say about that, this uh, trend, uh, which is, on the other hand, quite normal, of trying to regulate the uh, practice? Restorative justice practice. I mean, you have initiatives from the Restorative Justice uh, Council, for example, but also from other organizations where they're trying to standardize restorative justice uh, practices mm. in a way to guarantee quality mm. and uh, to ensure that uh, people are getting uh, the best possible service in every occasion. Mm. So, do you think that uh, trying to standardize uh, in effect, to turn restorative justice into a profession mm. uh, would uh, detract from the uh, nature of restorative justice, from the essence of it. Mm. Yeah, I need to be careful how, I, you know, how, how to answer that because, I mean, on the one hand, I am not a practitioner. I don't. I'm not going to lose my job. Uh, you know, if, <laughs> I, if I say what I say <coughs> about standardization and profit, professionalization of restorative justice. So I'm quite free in that respect. And my role is, again, a researcher, so I sit in the middle. Um, sometimes I say, you know, things that people who work in the restorative justice field like, and sometimes they don't like it. But I, I try to stick to everything. So I don't want to say anything that would, you know, will affect people who have a job or people who want to get a job. But what I would say in terms of evidence, and there's a lot, um, of especially few um, articles and books on this, um, if you Google standardization of restorative justice or professionalization of restorative justice, there's a few good articles. We need to do that. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and there are, you know, the views are out there. I, I publish my own views. If you Google the marketing organization of restorative justice, you'll get blocked in a couple of articles there. So the evidence is there in terms of what, you know, what direction we should take. I would say that each country has its own um, requirements and its own context, whether that's a social context, a legal context, so on and so forth. So if we are, I mean, in the UK, is a classic example of sort of justice was developed from communities by individual practitioners. And we're now, over the last five years, going down a very kind of top-down and um, structured way of providing restorative justice. Whether mm -hmm. that is a good thing or not is not for me to answer. What I would say is that it doesn't have to be an either or. So as you develop a more controlled top-down way through the criminal justice system offering it. Let's not forget the historical uh, provision of restorative justice and continue supporting those individually, locally-based, uh, community-based organizations or individuals. And sometimes mm. they don't even have an organization, they just do it. So civic, uh, civic movements? Yeah, I've heard the civic society, uh, the poor civic society. Right? So when you impose your restrictions because you're providing through a criminal justice system or a top-down or funded kind of approach which you know is absolutely um, acceptable in a specific context then um, let's not forget the historical provision of restorative justice um, and i'll give you one quote from john braithwaite who um, was debating about this back in 2001 when he published an article in the british journal of criminology just called standards for restorative justice he said we need to be very careful when we impose standards for restorative justice. Try and say that, you know, that um, a practitioner needs to be on a register. Try and say that to an elder in Australia. You know, it put that in the context of Australian provisions or New Zealand provisions of restorative justice of elders that have been doing this and doing circles, same goes to Canada, 
for centuries and ask them to go into a register. Contextually, it doesn't make any sense. Socially, it doesn't make any sense. Now, whether that makes sense in Europe or whether it makes any sense for the UK, that's a different question. Yeah? But I'm not a UK-based researcher. I'm an international researcher. So I have to put it in the context of, you know, of the sort of justice in the world. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And people who write about some of this, they, you know, they will put it in a specific country context. Okay. Um, you do travel a lot, and you have mentioned that. Uh, I mean, you are now an international institute with all that that means. Uh, yeah. Um, in terms of uh, the UK, for example, what do you see? What have you seen in other places that you think we're not doing well here in the UK or could do better? And what things uh, have you seen here in the UK that you think that uh, could be applied to other places because uh, uh, it constitutes, in a way, good practice or best practice? Uh, better in terms of what? In terms of. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, RG services, the provision of RG services. Mm. Um, you mean like uh, doing specific practices on the ground and looking at different cases or different different cases, policy all, research, all of those things. All of those things. Oh my god. <laughs> um, okay. Well, I don't know. I mean, I don't know what is good and what is bad. Again, I mean, I, I, I tend not to, you know, go down that road. Um, you know. You don't want be, to be being a researcher and academic. You have to be neutral and, you know, uh, not name uh, and shame. You know, uh, but I tell you this in terms of you know having been in different sectors in this country, um, there needs to be a lot more learning uh, on how we can work better together and less uh, more constructive competition as opposed to destructive competition. Mm -hmm. And the sector, because it's not that big, and the people who work in that sector um, are not so many, mm -hmm. uh, a, a lot more gelling and a lot more um, you know, understanding and dialogue, mm -hmm. I think, needs to uh, happen. And I say this with a uh, bittersweet, I think, tone. Though restorative justice and media to success is all about dialogue, I would say it's the sector that speaks not so much to each other <laughs> the most. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've seen other sectors, because I was in the BME sector before, there's a lot more talking, there's a lot more, yes, a lot of shouting and a lot of arguing, but mm -hmm. that's part of their dialogue, that's part of their process. So I would love to see a lot more dialogue and a lot more talking and a lot more shouting if we need to, you know, between practitioners, between mediators, but also there needs to be a lot more bridges between practitioners, researchers, mm -hmm. and, and policy makers. Mm -hmm. yes, that we need to work better together. Like the restorative forum, which is a, a melting pot, uh, a place for all to meet. <laughs> We're doing but, for you now. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, you have to take the chance when it comes. Yeah. Uh, what I was thinking is that that same complaining, if you like, was made uh, by John Collins on a recent blog on the Restorative Justice Council's um, website. It's also on the Restorative Forum, by the way. Uh, and I have heard it from many people that I have talked to. Uh, there is very little cooperation. Everyone seems to be very acutely aware of that. Mm -hmm. uh, there's little cooperation between researchers and practitioners or the other way around. Mm -hmm. So, for, for example, mm -hmm. uh, projects are very close to researchers, mm -hmm. uh, which means that they cannot gather the evidence that is needed to support, uh, to pro to produce evidence and then to produce uh, uh, evidence-based legislation mm -hmm. or regulation. Uh, so everyone knows about it, everyone complains about it. What do you think is stopping people from cooperating more? Again, from a research point of view, and I did a, a project on the relationship between researchers and practitioners in the NHA field, if you Google again, it's one that was um, the Open University. So we did a, a, an open discussion and we had a a working group with researchers and practitioners that came through uh, the university. And I'll put all the links on, uh, on, on the website. And there is a report that um, gives specific recommendations. So the concerns come from both sides. And for instance, a practitioner will tell you, you know, I'm dealing with a domestic violence case. It's just very confidential. What reassurances do I get, you know, from the researcher that all confidentiality will be maintained and so forth and so forth, you know, and, and people will be very protective of their, um, you know, their patrimony. Do you think mistrust is one of the elements? Absolutely, yeah, mistrust. Um, and then the researchers, you know, will have their own issues and their own complaints, you know, uh, practitioners are very busy people, they don't have the time to, you know, but, uh, you know, the engaging in research is very time consuming and, uh, you know, it's a process and, 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 you know, the complaints come from both sides. Um, 
I would say, you know, when it comes to research and research and ethics, you need to stick to, you know, what we know and, and you know, the peer review process and have your differentiated and everything set up and, and have a name that you're going to do the job properly as well. Um, and stick to that, you know, yeah. because sometimes you don't want to, you know, when you're desperate to have a sample, you know, you, you can't dilute any of your methodology. You have to have an absolute robust methodology. And that's where the funder also comes in as, you know, with responsibility. They can't just begin in funding to do action research and restorative justice with the complex cases when there is no understanding of the protection that all those um, people who are going to be involved, you know, the victims or offenders or whatever, are being protected uh, while they're being engaged in the research. Is the research organisation, you know, known for its research ethics processes? Do they have a research ethics board? Do they get approval for that, from that board? What is the process of getting approval? Are they having insurance to protect if anything goes wrong? So all those things that funders do need to ask before they fund a research project, you know, they also have responsibility, but the researcher also has responsibility. That will make practitioners feel a lot more comfortable mm -hmm. and they will open the door more. Uh, but let's not forget something also. Um, by definition, restorative justice happens behind closed doors. Mm -hmm. Okay, So that needs to be respected. <coughs> if the victim and the offender don't want that, they are probably more than likely going to do something private. Or what do you use? Def well, if we are going to move away, not actually not move away, but if we are going to honour and respect restorative justice um, ethos, which doesn't let people through labels, or at least victims and, and offenders with a label that is constructed for the criminal justice system. Very specifically, okay? yes. So if we are going to move away from that, let's just call partisan and conflict, or you know, what, whatever Howard were you know, invented 30 years ago, <laughs> uh, but definitely not the labels of the criminal justice system. So. And, and sometimes who is a victim and who is an offender? But that's a different conversation. So if, if the practitioners are going to feel comfortable that all those safeguards are in place, and the same goes for those who are involved in conflict, mm -hmm. and when you do close the door, if they want to have that door closed without any researcher present, then that should be the case. Mm -hmm. If the researcher is allowed and has convinced that the parameters and the safeguards will be in place, um, then let's do that and let's learn more about restorative justice because there are good practices. I can tell you when restorative justice happens well, it happens really well. So mm -hmm. I've seen it, I've been in rooms myself, you know, you know, I've been looking at it, but sometimes it doesn't go that well. So when we do write about it, let's write about it with um, with confidence and with responsibility. You know? Let's not just shout about it and wave the flag without having the evidence. Mm -hmm. you know? And it's also uh, not a consistent practice. So when we talk about complex cases such as domestic violence and hate crime is one thing. Shoplifting and taking a Mars bar away from a shop is another. Okay, so let's talk about the specificities of it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But the interesting thing now that you were saying is, uh, is that uh, you, know, you have been to uh, uh, conferences yourself as a, as, a, as a witness. Well, not as a witness, but you have been present, uh, but not delivering conferences yourself. Right. When you say conference, you know, academic conferences, no, no, I mean, I mean, and, RJ yeah, conferences. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. So, I mean, there is this tendency in the UK. That's why, again, because I don't come, you know, from a kind of from a UK research background. I mean, sort of justice practice. This could be mediation, direct and indirect mm -hmm. conference in circles. I've been in a lot of circles. Yeah. Um, especially in Canada, um, panels. So but but I suppose that our, uh, circles are perhaps uh, because of their very nature, uh, mm -hmm. where you have a number of people in there. Uh, are more accessible, but uh, specifically RJ conference where you have two parties uh, using uh, your expression, that's very difficult to get into. It's very difficult to arrange for a person to go and be present when something like that. I understand that that you know that can interfere with the process. Hopefully not, uh, but yeah. a, a per a, a, another person there in that room can uh, be a distraction and could mm. potentially interfere with the process. Mm. But at the same time, you need to have researchers, for example, mm. uh, uh, mm -hmm. a, uh, have access to yeah. these events. Yeah. Uh, I have an example uh, with Professor Chris Berbeck from Salford University, mm. who is saying that, you know, I want to analyze more uh, turning points, the, mm. the turning point where people, you know, go from feeling in one way to feeling another, which actually happened during an RJ conference. Mm -hmm. But there's no way of getting access to that. There's mm. no way of getting access to this sort of thing. So, yes, that needs to be with the consent of both parties. Mm. 
uh, but uh, perhaps practitioners could mediate a bit more in that mm. but to uh, uh, argue the case mm. that uh, you know we need to have researchers mm -hmm. have access uh, to those events yeah as well as projects because uh, uh, you know yeah. in a conversation with another researcher Ian Marder who is also mm -hmm. a member he was saying like we don't have access to projects so you cannot uh, assess the uh, the status of a, uh, the situation before the project you cannot assess the project and you cannot assess the outcomes because you haven't mm. had access to to the project so mm. how do you generate how do you generate evidence mm. yeah again i mean i've written about evaluation of, of different actually practices and services um there's uh, so much about it so um when it comes to evaluation i would uh, one thing that i keep saying is that let's let's just not focus on again um um, indicators that are um, understood and imposed um, with a criminal justice mindset. So reduction of reoffending and things like that. I mean, mm -hmm. it is a valid thing to check, but there's other things to look at and for restorative justice. I said, let's not forget about outcomes. Let's not forget about asking not only you know the the venologies or venues, but oh, what actually happened. There is the process. You know, what kind of more was you know what, what we understand as um, indicators within the criminal justice frame of mind. Mm -hmm. um, to now to understand that, and it's part of a process, okay, you, you need to become part of the journey as well. And the journey doesn't finish and end in the mediation room. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's, it's a lot of preparation that happens before, as many practitioners know, then there is the mediation and the agreements and then what happens after. So being part of the journey is absolutely important for the evaluator and the researcher to understand and commit to it. Okay? Which again is a funder's responsibility, you know, when you're funding a restorative justice fund to make sure you have an inbuilt evaluation mechanism to make you support the practitioner, both in terms of energy and time, to have that genuine evaluation of the journey, not just of the one session or the two sessions that might take place. Mm -hmm. Now I, 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 I'm learning all the time, right? And and it, and I remember going to Chile two years ago, mm -hmm. um, where they asked me me to take good models from the UK to train their practitioners on restorative justice. And I was going up and down the country with another colleague of mine, who's a practitioner, um, and we thought we were going to go there and teach them. And we came back knowing more than what we thought we were going to go and teach them. So we took back a number of things that they were doing while they were considering themselves to be the, um, you know, the infantry of you know, the like babies of restorative justice, and they thought that the UK was like an elephant. And one thing that I did learn was when I um, met... Um, this uh, Center for Mediation at the University, Central University of Chile, was how they were uh, evaluating mediation cases. So these are cases that one to one, right? The offender mm -hmm. and victim, and the mediator. Um, and they didn't have the researcher in the room because they felt that it would be um, changing the dynamics. Mm -hmm. But what they did do, they created a special room in the center, you know, the mediation center, where. Um, it, it, it was allowed for the practitioner to see through a glass without being present and also be filming the case, obviously with consent and everything, um, without changing the dynamics. So they would know, they'd probably be observed if that was a choice or if they didn't want to be observed through a glass, then uh, would be filmed. Okay, So there was an option. And I was like, who, who has the resources and the, you know, the... Uh, the infrastructure to do that, but they did, and they were babies of restorative justice, they weren't elephants. So, sometimes you know, the elephants don't think, Well, before you actually do a case, do you have the right infrastructure to do it? You know, before, mm -hmm. and this is just one example, which is what prompted me to say, Okay, so if you can actually be present in the room without being present in the room, can you actually watch from a psychology point of view? Because one of the things that I was kind of passionate about is look at restorative justice from not from just the kind of the social airy fairy perspective but more scientific perspective so can you observe people like doing Something this something to do with or, the psychology yeah, that, of justice yeah, and, and actually the University of Chile wrote a chapter in, in that book so you can look at their own evidence um, which is mainly about mediation um, through an evidence based chapter in that book so I thought you know when people scratch their head or their nose or they do this or they get like this and from a psychologist point of view and the psychologist observes that what does it mean, you know, when you change the dynamics in the room? Can restorative justice be supported through psychology? And that was when I visited Chile, and uh, they had a, a couple of experts with psychologists, and they were working with them, and the mediator would go in the room. 
So we started talking about that and how you bring those um, those two together. Mm -hmm. um, and one thing led to the other, and I thought, look, there's a lot to be done in terms of bringing di different disciplines together. So psychology is, is one discipline, but I thought, you know, with that book, for instance, is, um, which was a challenge for me, so I get bored quite easily. So I thought, what sort of challenge am I going to get now? Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, I need to bring different dis disciplines together. So that book is not just psychology. I call it the psychology of restorative justice for, for a reason I'll tell you in a minute. But in fact, what you have is neuroscience. So there's a you know, guy called Dan, you know, he's a, he's a um, neuroscientist. Yeah, he's on YouTube. He, he is on TED. Uh, yes, he has a... I'll put a link uh, on this interview. To his very good uh, video. And again, that was an experiment that he, he was doing with... Um, with restorative justice and neuroscience. So there's a neuroscience in there, there's uh, um, psychology, there's social social uh, sciences, there's legal perspectives, human rights perspectives, different disciplines, so it's not just psychology. Um, so what it does, it's trying, it, it's trying to start a debate where restorative justice is looked at as a topic and as an issue from different disciplines, not just one discipline, not just social sciences. Um, so applied sciences is another one. Uh, not not just to understand it, but also to push it a little bit further. So just taking psychology again, you know, if you are going to use the tools of psychology, and there is also you know so-called positive psychology, mm -hmm. you know, looking at people's talents and supporting those talents as opposed to be looking at them as risks and managing their risks. So if you look at it from a positive psychology point of view, how can we develop a sort of justice uh, better? How can we look at things that are not working that well? Um, and how can all these disciplines come together, together, you know, mm -hmm. not just in isolation, but uh, as a unified concept mm -hmm. to support this thing that we call restorative justice? That's very interesting because, uh, you know, all the questions that I had here for you were examples to follow. You have already talked about uh, the University of Chile, mm -hmm. and you're talking about, uh, uh, talking about, about um, you know, having different disciplines, scientific disciplines, uh, working uh or being applied to restorative justice to try to advance uh, the research and the science in there. So, what examples do you have? What do you think that uh, uh, needs to be done uh, at the moment? Let, let's make it specific to the UK because I know you have experience from all over the world. Let's say for the UK and then if you want uh, from a different country that you have good knowledge of. And also, and uh, w we mentioned this before uh, when we were in conversation, uh, one not to do. I think that uh, uh, learning from mistakes mm. uh, is very valuable, mm. and a lot of people don't like that. They don't like to admit to have done something wrong uh, for very uh, 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 obvious reasons. But also, you know, something a mistake, something that goes wrong, can be a very good learning opportunity. Mm. So, have you come across any of those as well, whether personal or uh, in the context of a of a project? Um. Yeah, I mean, again, it's not about me naming and shaming. Um, I, 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 you know, people get funding uh, to do work, and you know, I, I don't want to be the person who's going to be responsible for their salary tomorrow. Um, but um, what I would say, I mean, human nature doesn't like to admit, uh, you know, that we do things wrongly, but we do things uh, wrongly, whether with intentions or not. So, I would say. You know, when it comes to at least restorative justice, is the more this is there's a paradox. So, the more complex the case is, from my experience, having done this for a number of years, the more successful restorative justice can be, and, and it should make sense to people, right? Because restorative justice is all about engaging in those emotions and the truths and the hard realities of what happened to somebody. You do realize that that runs counter to the impression of many people. Where of they course. say restorative yeah. justice is just for uh, uh, shoplifting. Yeah, and nothing to do with uh, domestic uh, uh, abuse or anything like that. Yeah. Which are people, obviously, who haven't studied restorative justice. So um, those who have done it and who have seen it, um, they will know. And, and it's common sense anyway, because we're not talking about um, the sausage machine, as I call it, the criminal justice system, which processes things. This is about investing into people's um, true emotions and it's very difficult and complex so the more complex it is the more success um, you will have with restorative justice now this is the paradox though because the more complex it is the more risks involved okay so if we're talking about domestic violence case which is an ongoing 
situation with power structures, and the same goes for hate crimes and so on. Right? There's already a power a power structure already in place, right? Um, so, though on the one hand it creates these huge possibilities for restorative justice because it's a ground where emotions can be engaged and with support of psychology and neuroscience and all those sort of things, you can channel them, you can you can tap into them, you can you know you can understand them, you can uh, benefit from from getting angry. You know, what did you do to me, Miguel? You know, let's find out. In I, I guess you're talking about bond. strong engagement of both yes. parties. I mean, how much emotions can you have if you take, you know, that chocolate from my desk, or if you, you know, kill my mother? So the more angry I am, the more dialogue and the more conversation we're going to have. Um, so by definition, social justice is all about those extreme and complex and difficult feelings and managing the situations. That's what it's, it should be, you know, about. But at the same time, it creates risks. So when I see people taking those risks without being prepared, without preparing those who are going to be involved in those risks, then um, I get very, very angry and I get very, very concerned. And I was involved in, and still am still involved in, in a project called Child Sexual Abuse. Um, and the project that I've been involved in, which started in the US, is about child sexual abuse in the Catholic Church. And Do you know um, there's a film out now about that? Yes, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and, and there was a case where... Um, after many years of abuse, um, the child, which was then uh, you know, at the time, and I can't say too much, but at the time, obviously, there was um, 20, 20 years passed from the um, abuse, and the person had a family and two, two children and married and so on and so forth. Well, he kind of put it under the carpet, but never accepted. But it, then discussions didn't take place, and um, was offered this sort of justice as part of the evaluation and research team. And it didn't. It wasn't, uh, you know, done properly. Uh, there wasn't enough preparation. And then when the feelings started to surface, and when you bury them for so many years, and suddenly they come up, um, and there's not uh, support, there's no understanding, there's no follow up. There's just, let's just get it done, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, it backfired big time, and then to the point where you know it's one of the most emotional experiences of my research. I can tell. <laughs> yeah, so, and I don't want to talk about it, um, but it did backfire. So, though on the one hand I'm saying that I do have the evidence to say the more complex, the more success you have, at the same time the more complex and more risks involved. So, that's why I would classify people who are practitioners, not in terms of a register, but in terms of seniority, or experience and years, and the complex cases that they've done, and let me have a look at the complex cases that you've done. I don't need to see whether you're registered or not. I don't, really. That doesn't mean anything to me. I want to see how many cases and complex cases you've done. Tell me what sort of cases, what, what did it involve, where was it, you know, what was the outcome of it, rather than just, is your name there, did you pay £500 or whatever it is. You know I mean, it's not, it's not like you're a lawyer. Or, you know, it's, it's, it's very different. Mm -hmm. So experience and what I would call senior practitioners is one thing, and then practitioners will get trained for two or three days, and then off you go. You know, it's another thing. Yeah. Well, but I mean, uh, I completely agree that uh, obviously you need uh, experience as a degree in this case, uh, as in many other situations in life. But you have to start somewhere. I mean, the three-day uh, uh, training course for practitioners, which is a standard, mm -hmm. uh, most organizations tend to offer three days. I mean, I suppose that what's lacking is that after those three days, you need to be able to provide those uh, people that you have trained with uh, opportunities to uh, practitioner, and they need to be supervised mm -hmm. at the beginning, obviously, they need to be advised uh, by more experienced practitioners. But uh, what happens often, uh, in my experience, is that uh, there aren't enough cases. For example, here in the UK, you have a lot of services sprouting, because uh, this is something that is supported by the government at this point. And a lot of people are training, are being trained, a lot of services are being set up, but sometimes uh, either there aren't, there aren't enough cases uh, for people to, to actually keep up with the skills. Mm -hmm. That happened to one of the uh, members of the Observatory from that interview some time ago, Christina Barbosa, where she was trained and then she said, well, you know, you train and then you don't have the opportunity to practice. Yeah. So obviously you don't develop. Mm. But uh, on the other hand, you have problems with uh, this. Is, this is very common. Yeah. Information with uh, uh, exchange with the police, for example. Yeah. Where you know you have a service with people that have trained, and you don't get cases through because yeah. uh, of uh, 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 you know the police not wanting to 
or not having the protocols in place to yeah. pass the information about victims and offenders mm. or both parties yeah. to these services. So it's a different, it's a difficult situation. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I, I would say, well, as restorative justice has been, I mean, in the UK, because we were talking about the UK now, you have those who have been doing restorative justice for donkey's years, they have their own networks, they have their own ways of getting their referral, they've worked hard to, to set up those referral networks and so on and so forth, and they're the independent practitioners. And then you have the agencies in the criminal justice system, whether it's called probations, trusts, or police, or whatever, right? So, it, and now it's been provided through the criminal justice system, so courts can divert cases mainly through the probation um, service. So, if it is a practitioner within the probation service, they're probably totally they're overwhelmed and they don't know what to do with managing cases, but they are, again, people who probably get three or four days of training. Um, now, do they link with the practitioners who have been doing it for donkey's years and maybe their referrals are going down? Maybe that's another issue to talk about because it's about networking and connecting those those different providers, okay? How often, how easy, you know, is it for a probation trust and whatever criminal justice system are providing sort of justice services to connect with existing services and the other way around. So that is a lot of work to be done there. Um, when the case cases are there so that you can distribute them in a, in a, in a way that makes sense, okay? Uh, now, I would say this, but not, and I haven't done much work in this area, but if, you know, whether there are enough cases or not, you know, if, but up from what I hear, there are. You mm -hmm. know, more people, and then I did a survey with victims, like a, last year, and it's that book that you have, you know, the victims book. Um, victims, and, and, you know, people have done this <laughs> service with victims before. There is, you know, the Home Office research and um, the Ministry of Justice research. Victims do want to engage with story of justice, or at least in their majority. When they know about it, when they don't know about it, they say we want to know more about it, and of course, it's those a small percentage that they don't. So there is, there is, an, you know, a demand. Um, but I say this: if there is no demand, so let's talk about I don't know the criminal, the the NHS, right? And people don't want acupuncture. You know, why would you train acupuncture therapists when there is no demand for acupuncture therapists? You you know, train physiotherapists if there is more demand for physiotherapists. So why would we stress about, you know, whether they get in training or not if there is no demand? So if there is no demand, that's fine. Sort of justice is not needed. Uh, but I don't have the evidence. So in a, in a way, what you're saying is that get the systems and the protocols in place first to ensure that those who do want to have uh, a restorative justice interventions, if I can call it that, can get them and then worry about uh, the supplies, uh, the supply side. Um, I, 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 I probably a good understanding of, of what sort of demand is out there, you know, and if there is demand, again, what sort of cases, so if we are talking about complex cases, do we have enough senior practitioners to take them on, right? Um, and then if there is, if there isn't demand, then let's not worry about training, let's not worry about creating more practitioners, right? Um, but if there is, then let's put the infrastructure, infrastructure in place um, especially for complex cases, that you know there is somebody to take it on. Now, if it's about just the sausage machine again, <laughs> um, do we have enough hands to process the sausages? You know, <laughs> and and I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to be involved in a sausage machine like restorative justice version. And I get a bit worried because sometimes I get the feeling that in the UK we are going down that that road. In in a way, it's a consequence of. Uh, uh, the, the top-down introduction of restorative justice and the way yeah. it is funded, I imagine. Uh, yeah. It is now sort of a requirement, isn't it, to offer restorative justice interventions to yeah. victims. Uh, and, uh, you know, some scrupulous people will uh, run proper assessments mm -hmm. of suitability and eligibility, and some others will just say, well, we need as many cases as possible yeah. and see this as a way to, you know, to generate income, and that's it. Mm -hmm. So there's those things. Um, one thing that I was wanting to talk to you about is uh, your views, uh, because obviously you have uh, a breadth of experience, you have travelled the world, uh, and you have seen many things. Um, what do you see as the emerging trends uh, in restorative justice uh, worldwide, or if you want to speak to uh, about specific countries, that can be as well? Mm. And uh, what do you see as the uh, challenges uh, that are uh, uh, restorative justice uh, community is going to have to face mm. in the future. Yeah, I want to 
finish with a positive note, but at the same time I have to be um, honest with my observations and concerns. And you probably know that I do with Total Justice, you know, day to day stuff is more than getting the funding for a charity coming in and getting the money then. Okay, <laughs> you know, <coughs> managing an organization and you know, all those things. Boring. Uh, but anyway, um, it's not just the UK, I think, that's facing um, this issue in terms of social justice, as I'm going to tell you. Um, it, I think it's more of an international uh, concern. And um, having been probably, well, it, brought, it was brought back in the, well, in the 70s, was, you know, theoretically and practically, and it was put on the map. Um, then uh, you know the interest was growing and growing and growing, which was a good thing, um, and the movement was growing. Um, and I've been very fortunate to meet a, a lot of people who have been, you know, um, grandfathers and grandmothers and fathers of this social justice. And um, so I've been very fortunate in that respect. And I think one thing that I probably really would share um, is the concern that social justice is. Um, gradually being introduced into the current paradigm when Ms. Christie was talking about a different paradigm back in the 70s in a way that um, it ignores the power structures that this paradigm is based on um, and those power structures come from um, whether you want to call it a legislative approach or a top-down way of, of providing a criminal justice service. Um, now don't get me wrong as I said as a lawyer and a human rights uh, Criminal law lawyer, uh, I know very well the importance of, of and, and also the history of having human rights standards and you know the, the minimum standards and safeguards that need to be in place, and that all comes with the criminal justice system. You know, people had to fight, you know, they had to have two world wars to have those human rights standards, so that's very, very important. Um, but as we progress with this social justice, if we forget that there is a structured and unstructured way of providing this social justice, then we won't be doing justice of what social justice is all about. Now, so my concern is, as government, whether it's for the UK, UK government, whatever government, doesn't understand that and um, pushes people to provide it only in a certain way, and the funding is given only for those organisations or those providers employed at that way, then uh, it will soon come to its demise. And I have written about it with concern for the last few years. Um, and it's not about not respecting the standards. It is about respecting the way social justice is respecting the standards. Uh, so more understanding when you provide policies uh, for social justice, funding for social justice um, is needed. Um, and at least in the UK, I said two years ago, it's on a train that will crash. I just want to be honest. That's why I came off different advisory boards and different different bodies that you know support the social justice from a perspective that I'm, you know, creates a lot of anxiety for me. So when that train crashes, and it will crash, <laughs> um, I don't want to be on it, and then the train will come, you know, back on its tracks again, and, and, and it will be fine, because the story of justice has been around for, for centuries and centuries and centuries, and no government or anybody um, can claim it, and anybody can destroy it. You know, it will mm. come back because it's not owned by anybody, it's owned by the community. So that's the positive note I think I would end on. Um, and, and as I said, it's not just a UK issue, it is a global issue and a global mm -hmm. movement. Um, and we all have responsibility in that. Okay, well that's not the end note, because this is the end note. Uh, I said that we would talk about, we would talk about the, this book, The Psychology of Restorative Justice, which, which was our prize yep. uh, for the prize draw, I think it was back in November mm -hmm. or October 2015. Uh, this book, guys, is available um, uh, online. Uh, if you go to the restorative forum to the member offers uh, section, you will see that uh, you can get a 50% discount on this particular book and others by Dr. Theo Gabrielides. So have a look, check it out, and uh, well, <laughs> read it. <laughs> so, Theo, thank you very much for your time. My pleasure. And uh, I hope to see you again soon. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.